food. It is as essential as air is to breathe and water is to drink. Food is life. But where does our food come from? The Bahamas has more than 2,000 farmers, but it's hardly enough to keep up with our growing population. Or is it? We travel the nation to find out the answers to the questions everyone is asking. Can we grow enough fruit and vegetables? Can we raise enough sheep, goat, and chickens? Can we catch enough fish to feed a country with almost 400,000 people? Keep watching as we find out from the people who make it happen. Can we feed ourselves? At 80 miles long and 4 miles wide at its widest point, and 165 miles southeast of New Providence, this is Long Island. The island has had many names. First called Yuma by the Lucayans, it was later renamed Fernandina in honor of Christopher Columbus's benefactor, Ferdinand, the King of Spain. It is believed the explorer visited Long Island in 1492 not long after he made landfall on San Salvador. With this discovery came enslavement and eventually the extermination of the Arawak people. The island remained largely uninhabited until the 1700s and the arrival of the Loyalists from New England and New Jersey during the American Revolution. These inhabitants began the island's first farms, concentrating mainly on cattle and sheep. They were joined later by settlers from the Carolinas, who set up plantations, the crop, cotton. This lasted until the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. Many of those farms ended, but the rich tradition of farming remained, with Long Island gaining the reputation as the country's premier producer of sheep. The rocky terrain of Long Island made difficult for farming, but over the years, her farmers mastered the art of pothole farming. They say, if it can grow on Long Island, you can grow it anywhere. But there is one thing that isn't growing on Long Island, the amount of farmers. The urban pull of New Providence and Grand Bahama, along with the recent terror of hurricanes Joaquin and Matthew, has caused many to give up and simply leave. But not all are leaving. This is Gregory Comer. Comer moved back to Long Island to farm on his family's multi-acre plot of land in Wimses, Long Island, just across the street from St. Andrew's Anglican Church. Comer raised sheep and grew citrus and other fruit. His crops have been mostly wiped out by the hurricanes, but he still has a small flock of sheep. It hasn't been easy. Come, 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 come! Right now, we don't have the feed in the land, so I gotta buy feed, and it's very expensive, very expensive. I get some from the, 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 the farm place in Carmichael, you know. That helps, that helps a lot, it's not a lot. But I gotta get food out of the States, and it's very costly. To maintain his flock, Culmer needs feed. Before the hurricanes that brought the salt that compromised his feeding pastures, taking care of a large herd wasn't a problem. Well, as you can see, I have sheep, so uh, Christmas, around Christmas, and we got a time I slaughter, because uh, that's the time I put them on, and I can't get enough. But right now, with after the hurricanes and stuff like that, the feed is not there. So I have to cut back on them now and then, because I slaughtered all my rams, so I wouldn't have any more babies for a little while. And, okay, and maybe another uh, 10 months yeah. to a year, I'll put some fresh 
rams back in here and then redo it again and that by that time I hope to have soft growing for the sheep so I wouldn't have that big expense you know buying feed all the time and that's where the big problem is. This is what's left of Culmer's feeding pastures. Where sorghum and saratro once grew, he now has wild rosemary. The sheep won't eat it. Back in history, it shows that, you know, we can produce it here, but, you know, with all these obstacles in the way, it's going to take time to get back to that, you know, time that we was really productive here, because everyone had sheep. I mean, sheep and goat, because you ride around in the road everywhere and run around, but, you know, but it's not many people now who's doing it on a vast area, because like I said, it, the feed is not there, and you gotta have feed to feed sheep. Sheep gotta be fed every day in fresh water. I have eight uh, pastures, and what I need now is some help in getting them cleared so I could grow grow my feed like sorghum and uh, saratro and different grasses that I get the seed for and this will help me a lot and it'll better for the sheep too because they'll be eating green, more green. You can't find much uh, stuff to feed them like you know to go out we used to go chop brow and stuff like that because you know everything is just coming back from the hurricane so it's going to take some time and I hope soon that we'll be in a position to continue with that. Comer says he hasn't quite given up on the future of farming on Long Island, but being a realist, he can't help but note the challenge ahead. When you drive around, you'll see some farms all over Long Island just coming back up. But the only th problem is the kids are not really interested in it, and that's our biggest problem, is the elderly view. When our crew die out, but I'm sorry for us, because all they want to do is play on their machines. You know, they, they're interested in no farming and stuff like that, which is sad, you know, because we have the land, you know, and they're growing up, and we need more people to come back to the island and do work. Dorothea Fox is a seafood buyer in Salt Pond. She sums it up this way. When you talk about Long Island, Right in our area here, salt pond, you can't hardly grow anything, say, in the farms because we have a problem with water. We don't have no water supply. We got lots of salt water, but when it comes to fresh water, we have a big problem because, you know, we can't, we, we don't have no running water. And we have to wait on the water truck sometime. You call up there, sometimes three days, then you call the outer water before they deliver it to you. So right in here, we can't hardly grow anything because it's very dry, you know. Well, if then it's rainy seasons, now you know, you can start stuff, but then when we get those dry seasons, everything just leave us. No water to water with, so right in our area, it's not much you can grow, like from the farm or anything like that. And then another thing, livestock, well, ain't none of that in here. So it is, and I don't think it's that much on the island anymore, you know, and many years gone by, well, plenty of people, that's what they really used to do, but I don't think the younger set is too much into that, you see? And then all the younger people have to leave the island because there's no jobs. And that's why the island is dying, because all the young people just gotta go someplace else to look for, I guess, a future, because there's nothing here for them. I'm Alvira Betty Turnquest from Deadman's Key, Long Island. I do farming and I'm a housewife. Known to most people as Betty, Elvira Turnquest knows a lot about farming. Her son, Tyrone, has taken over the business that has been struggling to recover following Hurricanes Joaquin and Matthew, and the loss of his father in late 2017. With his mother's experience and everything he's studied, the retired police officer has been preparing for this job virtually all of his life. The duo wants to turn farming into a year-round operation, 
to do that, however, they will need some help first. The only thing we would really need here the year round is a tractor. That as you know, when you did the ground, like when the bananas run down, you need a tractor to turn up the ground so you can replant. Like for corn and your bananas and pigeon peas and all those different things and vegetables. It's good to have a tractor around that when you're ready to, like September or October, to turn your, your ground up to put that for the throw seed, put seeds and stuff. You know, like what you grow, there are plenty of times you could go there, whatever you grow, you could could eat it. You know, you could you have enough stuff to, to, to cook what you grow. You take like these and if I feel like eating, boiling them, put them in for rice or soup, whatever. And you got to get more of the young people involved. You know, let them know what they can, you know, like, well, you take like Andres. If we have, if Long Island had the soil like Andres, I don't know what we would do. We're placing a considerable amount of product on the tables as we speak but we need more persons to farm in order to bring that import bill down tyrone has a plan tyrone wants to make banana farming a big industry again on long island but he's using his ingenuity along with some good old-fashioned farming know-how from his elders to make it happen but bananas aren't the only crop the family focuses on to supplement their income, the Turnquest also harvest top to plat straw for the handbag makers in Nassau and on Long Island. It's good money, but their first priority is the banana farm that sits in the shadow of the Deadman's Key Airport. Okay, this is a portion of a pet here that we have on the cultivation. But we can eventually get the whole pit on the cultivation after a while. I got the, the grenadines, uh, some lacatan, plantain, bastard sugar, and one or two dwarfs. Mm -hmm. They're the only varieties that I have in there at the moment. His fruit crops aren't the only things on the farm. See, a hog can smell 20 to 25 feet of the ground. So they, they, their eyesight is not as good as we think it is but they rely on scent. When a banana is half full, they can smell that. That is why they, that is why they catch those short bananas so much, because they can smell them. Because of Long Island's rocky terrain, Tyrone is using a unique method of farming perfected by Long Islanders. We have a, a DA that is being used to rip a quarry pit. Once the quarry is down to the water level, the, tr the, tr the trees that were pushed out initially will be placed back at the bottom of the pit and the fill that came out off the top will be placed on top of that. The tractor would crush the rocks and then they would rip it and I'll be able to plant product in here again. On top we're looking at primarily watermelon and banana. Tyrone plans to expand his operations by digging a few more pits on the farm. It's all a part of a master plan. At the moment, I'm trying to get to the level where I can produce 10,000 bunches of bananas per month. But it's gonna take a while to get to that. I'm gonna have to expand the farm as more and more banana suckers become available. I'll just continue to expand and, and it would be a yearly expansion over a period of about 10 to 15 years. This is a particular type of sugar banana that we got from, from Asia. This is a hybrid of the regular of, of, of what we call the apple sugar banana. It's a hybrid that came from Asia. But if you notice it, the bananas are tight fitted and they're basically one size from top to bottom. So the whole bunch is sold. You don't lose anything on this. When you cut this off, all the bananas here can go to market. And these are, the, these are, these are um, more disease resistant than any other species of banana that we have. While the Turnquests are prepared to invest in expanding their business, there are some things they feel the government can do to help. Take the water off of fertilizers and seeds, and then subsidize farming the way the other developed countries subsidize farming. That would improve the product that is coming to the table, and that would encourage more persons to farm. But at the moment, there's no encouragement to farm. If everything goes well throughout the whole Bahamas as a whole, each island that 
farm, I think we can be self-sufficient in food production. No doubt. No doubt. Tyrone and Betty believe that the Bahamas is on the tip of something big in farming. They may be on to something, at least on Long Island. My name is Romeo Josie, and I'm from Exuma. My dream, agro-tourism. I envision owning and operating my business on the islands of my heritage with having people visit. I want them to come and stay where they can get exotic fruits. I've had this dream since I was first introduced to the subject at Bamsi. What I learned at Bamsi was how to marry the science of agriculture and the art of agriculture. Learning at Bamsi takes place in the classroom, but it also happens in the field. Bamsi is so important for the Bahamas because it helps young generation to understand how important agriculture is to this country. Bamsi is also helping us to realize the vision of our forefathers, as this country can be great and have an awesome economy through diversification in agriculture and marine. Now I have a role to play in the future of farming in the Bahamas. Pamsi is definitely changing lives for a stronger Bahamas. Could you imagine if we were just able to produce 20, 30, 40 percent of what we eat and the amount of monies, hundreds of millions of dollars, what that means, in the pockets of local farmers in the family islands, growing their communities, having that money is to build houses, support their children in college, um, expand the local industries uh, because we would have that foreign reserve going directly into their pockets and on top of that too we would be keeping that foreign more of that foreign reserve here in country so it's an opportunity for us to grow our family island communities in in massive ways in major ways I've always said that there's two areas two ministries that I believe play the most vital role in keeping people in the family islands to stop the rural push and the urban pull uh, and that is agriculture and tourism and when you get and both of those interestingly enough they marry each other because when you have tourists coming in they're not really truly interested in eating what they left behind they want to see what your local dishes are um, and uh, it's an opportunity for them to experience your culture and so agriculture and marine resource um, is certainly a way for us to be able to grow the family island communities because a lot of our farmer, uh, farmers and fisher persons are actually those who are in the family islands and we're wanting to bring the requisite technology to them so that they, be, so that they become more efficient producers and so that they would produce more so that we're able to put more monies in their pockets and have it remain in their communities. Maurice Minnis is the Department of Agriculture's man on the ground on Long Island. He's seen a lot over his long career, and he's hoping that by the time he's done, he'll also see the resurgence of farming on Long Island. Historically, Long Island was one of the major producers back in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. What has happened since then is we have had an exodus of young persons to Nassau. So the average age of the farmer has increased to about 70, 75, 80. What is, and what we have now are a lot of farms that are unattended. There has been no family succession with these farms. And basically the island is like a, a graveyard of dilapidated farms. The decline of fully functional farms on Long Island is a major concern, no question. With the average age of farmers north of 65, the drive to bring up new farmers is more than urgent. In fact, it is critical to the continued survival of Long Island. I'm Stanley Pender and I come in my farm almost every day, water the plants because I love to work. Water the plants and if any plant look 
perfect it. I would take that one out and put in a better plant. Mm -hmm. Just about an hour and a half or an hour or so and go back home and relax. Working on his farm is Stanley Pinder's idea of relaxing. He's been at it from he was a boy, but the farm isn't the only thing that's keeping him busy. Mm, I, 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 I run a couple of cars as a small business. They have a small business, run a couple of cars, five or six cars, and uh, I still do my farming late evening, and if somebody wanted to want a vehicle, I would stop and go and give them a vehicle. And I love to be in the farm, to be truthful, because that's my hobby. Some people don't like to work, I don't know the reason, but it's something good to have something to eat always. And then you could sell something or give somebody something, you know, have something to offer someone. That's why I like to work, you know, so that's my hobby. Pinder has tomatoes, okras, and of course corn for grits. But he's growing another crop that he has high hopes on coconuts. It's an investment he hopes to pass on to his children and grandchildren. For Pinder, no farm will be successful if it's not operated like a business. You only need to spend some money doing anything. You got to have, some, you got to spend some money because, because you cannot raise nothing unless you have a tractor. And sometimes a tractor is hard to get. When one was working north for the folks who had the, 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 the coupon and break down and that going from, I must be the end of the year and still break down, it didn't come north anymore. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you need, you, need, you need to spend money to, to, to raise, to have a farm at least. You cannot just cut down the bushes if you don't rain, then you, you, you may lose your produce. But if you get a water system, you see I have a sw small water system here to irrigate the plant, and without that, uh, you may have a dry season. You would still lose everything. So you would have to prepare for it right. And get a lot of soil and you could plant your, your things, your, your, your farm produce on, on, on a line instead of cross cut. Like the old folks used to plant it anywhere they could find soil, they put, put a corn or a piece. But if you have a the tractor, cultivate the ground, you could plant it yeah, on the farm, online, on rows. So, you know, you need, need, need to spend some money to, to um, have a nice farm. And uh, it, 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 some of the folks cannot do it off themselves. They would have to have um, government have to help the poor people. Because some people would like to do it, but they cannot do it, fin financially embarrassed. Without the funds, that's hard. You need to have some fund to begin anything, mm -hmm. because ain't no bank, even no bank would, would 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 lend you no money unless you have some collateral of some sort. You know, you can't. They, they won't be able to begin. I, for a young person, uh, unless their parents or something could help them, you know. But a person just starting off in life, it's it's rather hard to uh, without having some finance. Pinder says local farms are a must for the Bahamas, if only for the health benefits and taste of the food. It would be best if the, the Bahamas could uh, raise its own food, and it would be very good because the food which you grow is more better than the foods which you buy out of the store. Much better. People love to buy my green peppers. You buy the green peppers from the store, they don't even have scent because they, they, they use some chemical to, to preserve them. Even the bananas, it don't, it's not tasty like my bananas. Everybody say, Mr. Pin, how come your bananas is so sweet? It's because they, it's not, they, grow, they grow naturally from the ground. No, no, no chemical to preserve them, to make them hard, and you could ship them. You grow them and you sell them like how it is off the tree. It's always better stuff. Good advice for a farmer who's more than 80 years old. What's possible? The potential for Long Island is still good. What I try to teach the younger generation who are now more interested in fishing, I explain to them that when the weather get bad with fishing, they could use that time on the land to work on their farms. Uh, as you've seen from some of your interviews, 
most of the person you have interviewed were younger persons in fishing and even in farming. So if we could get that, uh, that dual uh, activity with farm and fishing together, basically is what, what the older persons were doing back in those days as well. Fishing and then farming. Fishing and farming. Lander Turnquest knows every plant that grows on his farm. See what happened, you wait until, uh, you wait until these are pods, well you know all these are pods, mm -hmm. you wait until they dry, mm -hmm. and you take out the seed, just like how you would take out peas and bean seeds, you know, to the, the, the cook, after the dry, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you put them in a pot with some water, oh, and you boil them, and they'll boil just like peas or, or beans. And when they boil, they become into a, 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 a oil because you know the name of them is castor, castor oil. And after the oil, right, you put it in, let it cool, you put it in jars, and you use it for your hair mm. or your skin. Mm -hmm. And then you drink some. Yeah, that's just like the oil you buy out, out in um, the store. Orlando Lander Turnquist has been a farmer longer than he can remember. Growing a variety of native fruit and raising his prized sheep for mutton. With two very large plots of land to deal with and at least 60 head of sheep in his flock, he's had to be very creative on how he manages his resources. This has led to Turnquist experimenting with what he can feed his sheep off of his land. It's knowledge he shares with his fellow farmers on a regular basis. And that was given, the seeds that was given to me by the Harold Adderley. Yeah, because I have a lot in my pasture in the back. Because when they started growing, very thick and, and oh, they covered the whole everything. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's some nice sheep feed. Oh, okay. Yeah. His ingenuity doesn't stop with the food his animals eat. Okay. This is like when the sheep come up to eat the jumbe. Uh huh. I got this tall, this tie from end to end. Uh huh. They can't throw my wire down. Okay, okay, okay. See? See why I have a tie? Mm -hmm. All of this? Mm -hmm. See, they jump up, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It holds the wire up. <laughs> On, 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 and all through my pastures, all in the back. You do that. All the old stuff from Botelco, mm -hmm. I go and I get it or they bring it for me. Uh -huh. And I get it round and round and round. Like his fellow farmers, Turnquest would like to see Long Island return to its glory days of farming. And he has some ideas on how that can happen. I would say the first start would be um, we, we provided with a D8 or D9 tractor and also a few more equipments for leveling off the ground after the tractor already ripped uh, the rock because it have to be the rock and, and then they smooth it off and they um, um, row it. That's what I would say for the first beginning. And then the second is after that um, um, we be provided with seeds and fertilizers and uh, some spraying insecticides. So I, that's what I would say. That is the first and the best for farming. Living on the Turnquest homestead virtually all of his life, you'd think he had seen it all. A recent discovery that started as a nuisance is turning out to be another potential feed for his flock. A flowering vine that he has never seen before is slowly creeping into one of his pastures. Thousands of these in the ground. They have a bulb. Yeah, man, like a peanut, like a peanut. Yeah. That's why I'm trying to tell you, you can't hardly kill them. Oh. Something like a cassava. And these here by the thousands. I wonder if it's edible. Now, oh, 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 there, I guess so. Where the sheep eat them. But yeah. yeah. you could see uh, that's, uh, that's, that's some type of um, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Round it for, yeah. for the it's sheep. It's a tuba. It's a tuba. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Thousands of these all through here. And see, how beautiful flowers. Yeah. And every one of them is a seed. Oh, I tell you, they thousands of these. Every one of these is a seed. Now, don't ask me the name because I don't know the name. All I know is wine. It's because of the aloes. Score it. Landa boasts of finding a use for everything that grows on his property, like this plant that has been a staple for Long Islanders for generations as a hygienic solution. Mm hmm. Ah, uh, see. So you get you get like a, a, a you get a, like a slime. Mm -hmm. I had water. See. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. And you drip that in the water. Oh, yeah. oh. Well, actually, I just showing you the short. The short um, side of this, uh, to show you the, the slime, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't have to do that when you wash your hair. But what you do, like I say, you have the basin or your container of water. You take this and, put and you put it in there for a, a while. But you do this before you really ready, ready to wash your hair. So some of this would, would drain out. So you put both, 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 um, mm -hmm. both sides mm -hmm. in the container of water. And then when you're ready, like guess how you do shampoo? Mm -hmm. You ladder, uh, you take your hand and you ladder or a little towel and you wet your, wet your head. Now after you wet your head, right? You let, and, um, um, this from in the water, you take this and use it to wash this. Ladder your head and this become like a soap, uh, okay. a soap surge. Okay, okay. And all your hair, all your hair, just like uh, you have soap, soap suds on it, and then you take your comb or your fingers and you just, just how you do shampoo. So, in all in all, the point I'm trying to make is, this is what we used to use for shampoo. Before you, uh, your mom, uh, my daddy, I always saw shampoo in I saw on the shelf. <laughs> It's knowledge like this that Landa Turnquist thinks is just as valuable as the fruit he grows or the animals he raises. He says Long Islanders don't know how to quit and that farming can be big business again. They just need a few things to fall in place first. Yes, well, we will be, uh, we'll be uh, able to export much more and we would be able to feed our own on this island. That means, you know, you, uh, you give some, you sell some. When I say give some, that means uh, uh, you're eating. You're living off it, from it. So, I think we would be doing excellent. And all together, different from the percentage I give you with uh, more, we are doing our island 100% good. But we need these things, what I tell you. If you know anything about Bahamian farmers, you know they love to talk, especially when they've just learned something new. She did take this and she did boil this mm -hmm. for pain. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And Miss Vandell, Teresa, mm -hmm. had some pain and stuff, and I sent her a bag, a bag of this. Mm -hmm. And she just, hey, she, she said she know the wine. Mm -hmm. Now she know the wine, she could get it down there. Okay. okay. But wow. then I gave her this. She said she ain't had no more pain for a week. My God, make everything for a My name is Timothy Quant. 
my name is Katie Hunt. We are on the farm in Buckley's Long Island and um, we have a name called Redland Farms and um, we grow pigs, we produce eggs, we do tomatoes, we do plantains, bananas and pineapples. Quant and Hunt believe in diversification on their farm, Redland Farms. While they get special joy out of watching their products mature for market, they admit that their egg-laying hens are special. The chickens, we enjoy um, working with them and we love to see them grow and, and um, give us some eggs. It's just a, 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 a four-speed watering system that we use with nipples. Um, automatic watering nipples for the chickens, you know, so they get the water, they have clean water. Uh, we change this twice a day. We f uh, fill it twice a day, we clean it every morning. So they'll have, you know, uh, proper, uh, proper feeding, uh, proper water, you know. The farm is bouncing back from the devastation of the last three hurricane seasons. And while it's not where they hoped it would be, they are pleased with the output so far. Uh, right now we look at about six, seven dozen per day, but um, we look forward to getting quite a bit more to increase that number. Their fresh pork business is strong as well. Quant says that came from learning their market and being patient with the product. Um, it's kind of slow rate, right, you know, but it goes off and on during the regatta, Christmas times, special birthday parties or weddings, that sort of stuff. People call and they want to, um, they want to purchase some pork or some mutton. <laughs> <laughs> but despite having a good thing going, the couple says it's not as easy as it looks. But, you know, like everything else, we, we, we try and it's just up to you <laughs> to make, you know, to, um, to want to go ahead and make it, and make it, you know. Um, if, if we try as, as farmers, um, I think it's, it's possible, but, um, you know, we, we have to be serious about it. Um, we have a lot of folks who say they're farming, but, um, you know, uh, if they, if they, um, you know, commit themselves more to, you know, it isn't that they don't know what, what to do. It's just a commitment, and we need more young people to get involved. Because most of the older farmers are gone on now, so we're trying to see what we can do to, to you know, to carry it on, sort of thing. But like everything else, my brother birds, I'll be honest with you. We need help. And the help we need is basically um, through the parking house, some product to be there that you could buy on demand rather than having to order all the time. You know, if you could just run to the parking house and say, I run short of feed, I need five or six bags to feed, rather than me having to wait a week on the boat, that, all of that will help us, you know. If the government is serious about the nation feeding itself, what they need to do is, um, like I say, similar to Jamaica, the bauxite company in Jamaica, they provide greenhouses for every school. They have a program that they're funding um, for the children in school, um, it may not be as large as that in the Bahamas on, on every island, but if they formulate some, something of that nature and really get the children involved in farming, in fishing, in whatever, um, but you got to be serious about it. Uh, if it isn't cons grown in the Bahamas, if it isn't made in the Bahamas, it should not be consumed in the Bahamas. I think I know that. Plenty of work. Yeah. Plenty of work. The farm is a two-person operation. 
we just had uh, import restrictions on tomatoes and, and sweet peppers um, as a result of the output from the Hayman Farms. So mm -hmm. Is that a step in the right direction? Yes, it sure. is. But it needs to be expanded with the help of Ministry of Agriculture, the parking houses, and like I told you earlier, if I need, say I need two or three bags of heat, they have to wait a week on the boat. If they put it in place and they have it in storage in the parking houses, um, I could run up to the parking house, get two or three bags of heat, and I don't have to worry about a week waiting on it, to what I can take in my animals. So what we do is, to avoid that problem, we order an abundance of feed um, up front. So, you know, we're trying to make sure that we could keep everything going the way we know it needs to go. <laughs> See, the, the thing is, you can't, you can't let the animals starve. You know, you have to have food on hand, and there's no way around here that, you know, can help you in that way. So uh, we totally rely on the government to do it for us. So, you know, it's, it's kind of hard when, when um, you know, you, you, you have to depend on them and then they, they're, they're behind with, with helping us sort of thing. You know, sometimes you order the feed and you expect it to come, say, this week. It, uh, you know, it, do, it doesn't come until another week or two. You know, where does that put you? It gives, you know, you, you, you're kind of discouraged, you know. Their concerns are real, but their enthusiasm makes up for the challenges. How long they can sustain their output remains to be seen, but they are confident that if their ideas hit the right ears, Long Island can definitely make a comeback. That is exactly what Maurice Minnis is counting on. We were rich with the production of corn, peas, and there were citrus, pineapples. Now our major crops, the two staple crops we have now, are papayas and bananas. As it is, both of those crops, we have had successive hurricanes for the past three years. And all of those crops now is I can say a on stream coming back on. Gabriel Pratt grew a lot of things on his farm in burnt ground, Long Island. He raised pigs, grew root vegetables like potatoes, eddies, and yams, as well as watermelon. He was also a fisherman. If he were alive, Gabriel would say that his best products are his children. Five daughters with a legacy to carry on. Nikita McIntosh is my name, and this is our father's farm. He has now been dead for the past year. He died in 2017. He's, he, um, he farmed it. He grew coconuts, sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes corn, um, red, peas. red peas, pigeon peas. Um, the girls, there are five of us, and we now have the vision to get back and work the farm. We cannot let his Dream go to waste, yeah. So that's what we're we're gonna do. We plan to get it all cleared out and planted. Coconut trees we plan to sell because Daddy sold from this lot before. He made like some thousand thousands of dollars. We sold down to um to Yonder Key before. So that's what we plan to do. Sell the coconut trees. It's gonna be like a coconut farm, like I say, and sweet potatoes, corn, a few peas, but the majority is corn, sweet potatoes. Um, our Bahamian store, uh, owner, store owners, they would purchase like coconuts from places down in the Caribbean. So what we plan to do in future, like once they, you know, they grow and get older and drop to nuts, we can go ahead and harvest those bark, those and 
sell them to vendors instead of having to go into Solomon's or uh, another food store and get coconuts, like you would have to crack once you buy it to, per to make sure it's not rotted, you get like your locally grown coconuts. It'll be a good thing if, as local Bahamians, if we would get back and get to the old time, like where our Grammy, our great Grammy and those farms, that'll be an excellent thing. So I would like to encourage all the young persons like to get into it instead of just waiting on the government. You know what I mean? We say, oh, the government doesn't provide this and the government doesn't provide that. But the Bible tells us that our gift should make one for us. We have it within our hands. He gave us the land. So just go ahead and farm. You know what I mean? So it'll be a good thing if we can get back into it. Where this land is, it's like a, a prime piece of property. It's like a prime piece of property that even like if it's uh, still day in the land, we still have breeze on this side, so it ain't like we can be over here sweating. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so it'll be a good thing. We'll be in the heat, but we wouldn't be hot. <laughs>
they'll get in maybe each boat will get in maybe like 600 pounds for each boat so six five say that's three thousand right so and sometimes they go out well they usually hardly make a trip that they don't get like in the 600s and stuff like that The hardship fishermen on Long Island were feeling went into overdrive with the passage of Hurricane Joaquin. Almost all of the island's fishing fleet were left devastated. Well, that was terrible. I know walking for us, that was terrible. But do you know that we had so much damage in walking because all the fishing boats, I guess you know, yeah. right up in that area there, you know, that's where all the fishing boats was and all went in the land and got destroyed, I mean, you know, they got destroyed. And then, but after the hurricane, it was the best crawfish season that we had since I've been working here. I've never got much crawfish as that. It was plentiful, it must be the hurricane. I don't know if we brought it in, but we had plenty crawfish after, after walking, that terrible hurricane. Um, I used to trap, but Due to the bad storms and the poaching, I was forced to stop. Mainly the poaching was the biggest problem. But now it seems as in the last, I would say about year and a half, two years, it's been pretty much under, under control. Not as many as boats, uh, poaching boats as like three to four years ago. Sometimes you would see eight to nine at a time. But now, well, I haven't been out to see now lobster in from uh, the foot last October, but the storm did the Southeast Bahamas really, really bad. Fishermen lost all their condos, the shoals got destroyed, some shoals just ain't there. The seabed is damaged very, very bad. As big a challenge as Joaquin was, the fishermen face even bigger problems. I gotta say, like <laughs> what the fishermen tell me, I guess you know they got a big problem with, you know, the Dominicans out there. Well, taking, I guess, what don't belong to them, what should be for us, but it's a problem too, because they say plenty of times they report, you know, them, and they don't see anybody come to the rescue, you know, to help, so they just, I guess they got to deal with it, so that's, I guess that's the biggest problem. The biggest thing right now, if the government don't try to help the fishermen, these islands just going to die. If they don't try to get some kind of, some kind of, something in place, the fishermen can't get no financing, number one, from the bank. You know, number two, um, um, the price of fuel high, grocery high. So if you don't go to sea now, if you don't go for three weeks or a month, five weeks, is you wasting your time? You know, the price of fish basically the same thing. Um, what it was when I started to fish from in 1992, at least lobster and everything. Diesel is is four times the amount. When I first started fish, this was a buck twenty-eight a gallon. Now it's mostly four eighty-eight. You know, so in comparison, you have the the, the expenses grown by a heavy margin. Jesse Knowles, owner of Captain Ducky, has this suggestion for conserving our grouper supply. Three and three quarter pound. The grouper only that size. Small grouper. You know what I'm saying? Now you're, you're, uh, five pound is a good size, I would say. Four pound, five. So by increasing the minimum uh, weight? You yeah, because you know, as I understand, when I learned from fisheries that all groupers are born females. So if you catch all the small groupers, you're, back, you're practically killing all the females out. You know? That's why I go into a hospital and we're all pregnant women. You know, and then yeah. you have no society left. Mm -hmm. Expanding our seafood diet may be another solution. I think what we really need is a canning factory and start, you got the market fish, you got turbots. Turbot is a very good eating fish. You have to know, know where to look for the rank, take the rank of the meat. You got pogies, you got grunts, you got barracudas. A lot of locals eat the barracuda. Test the fish before you put it on the market. You know, some people um, want to try it, but you know, it's a lot of our fish is not on the market, and they just there. Yeah. There's plenty, it's plenty of fish out there, especially a lot of deep fish. You know, as I try and uh, 
to um, invest into right now, like Red Snapper and mm -hmm. those big Warsaw groupers and you know, like 250 feet to go, a thousand. Mm -hmm. So you believe if, if 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 Bahamians were open to eating more variety of fish that we have, um, we probably could feed ourselves. Because like yeah. you said, you just mentioned red snapper. Most yeah. people don't really no. go looking for that, red but it's plenty of people. Like, about Long Island, that's like almost Virgin ground. You know, they don't really touch that. I don't think there's a sale on Long Island, a steady sale for red snapper. I don't think it's a steady sale at all, but you might find some in Nassau, definitely in Nassau because you know, we got the hotels, you got the sushi restaurants, they want a fresh rest not on ice, you know, but on Long Island and most other islands, you get virgin ground for rare snapper. Mm -hmm. So as I try to invest, I have another boat home, a 28 foot, I try to find some clients for some rare snapper, you know, mm -hmm. start out small then start to walk afterwards. The sky is the limit really for Bahamians to be able to make money in the agricultural industry and to supply uh, necessary services and needed services to the Bahamian economy and people. And you know, we spoke about the area of fertilizer and, and um, to add to that, one of the things that we're looking to do too is to connect agriculture and marine resource in that pieces of the fish other products that we that we can't export the bones and the other things that we can actually crush those up and actually um, put those create fish fertilizer that's an important part of growing uh, an agricultural industry as well you know you can process all of these things and create employment but we only concentrate on two, two or three things crawfish grouper snapper the conch basically and the conch the conch is just about going to be out when they first started the fish, you got a free dive conk in five to ten foot of water now. If you don't have a compressor, you can't dive no conk. I bought some limes from the store, only for buying sake. Because you, you got to put them in the microwave for 20, 30 seconds to get a little bit of juice out of them. I think if, if the government could help the farmers get on their feet and get started, yes, it could happen. You know, they concentrate on these islands look for the farmland and I'm um, help the people get set up. Yes, it could happen. Can we feed ourselves? Can the farmers feed if, if everything that we should do is done for farmers and for fishermen? Can we feed ourselves? Or at least can we reduce some? We spent a billion dollars plus bringing food into the country. We only produce 8% of what we eat between the water and the land. But like I said, this, it happened before, so why it can't happen again? And that is exactly what it will take.